why when I uh, throw a disc down the fairway, does the disc go boink, boink? That's what I was gonna ask you, is that if, if you're displacing the same amount of air up and down being pulled in, I mean, it's math. When you're throwing and you nail the middle of the thermal and you complete to the other end of the thermal, is it a net change of zero at the when it's all said and done? Uh, well, air quotes around the word like exactly zero, but I would I would say I would say because I'm I'm, I'm using I'm using the differences in air pressure. So I throw sixty, we're getting twenty mile. I, I potentially had eighty. So let's just say like I got eighty, maybe it was seventy, right? Maybe mm -hmm. I didn't get all of it in perfection. But what? So the first shot came off like this. A lot of lift sink out here. It, it still went like like. I wanted to go way further, but I think it went just shy of 500, right? But you could tell it fell out. No, that's not what I wanted. But I kept tracking the thermal. And so the next time I threw, and I mean, these are within 10 seconds, enough to watch the flight, go pick up another disc and throw. The thermal got into here. And so I threw higher off of here, knowing that the angle as the disc was panning out was gonna get into the thermal here. And so as the disc is going, it, I've got, it's sinking, sinking, sinking. It's in this part, it's, it's coming out sinking. Now I caught this section of the thermal. As the disc begins to pan, now it's going to tower. Now it's going to want to tower. Now, now all of a sudden the disc is coming down. And you see it out there, kind of go and kind of lift, and you almost see it like almost accelerate. What it seems like it accelerates, but it's it's getting the energy of the air going up now instead of air coming down, crushing it, killing it. It's get this. And so what happened is, is I threw three shots. I had one that was right here. I got a I got big lift, big got crushed out here, right here. Big lift in the middle of the flight, but then the moment it got out because the angle wasn't perfect, the tail dropped out and it just stalled. Almost, you know, that, that full nose stall where you see the whole top of the disc the whole way. But I knew with my final shot that if I threw my disc accurately and I caught this part of the thermal on the pan, that I was gonna get past. And so I used that, I knew where this was gonna be, at least in this moment, I got lucky, kind of really being able to track it well. But I knew where this was gonna be so that when my disc got into there, it began to pan out, it caught as it still had the correct angle and it lifted. And it went, I think, I think I had it like five, five, 45, 60 out of my, it, 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 it cleared, the, it cleared, I was wanting to hit the fence and, and I missed the fence by like 30 feet. Okay, so now I have to go, we're gonna maybe backtrack a bit here, yes. but now I need to know, if the thermal's caused by, this is a, uh, this is the sand, which is not retaining the heat, or this is the parking lot of the roof, that explains why the thermal's happening here. Why does the thermal move to here? wonderful question so like we said um, a thermal is part of the air movement it's, it's air going up but there's never a static air moving up think of smoke if you have smoke go up it goes with the wind okay so in other words so if the wind if this is a northeast wind or it's blowing to the northeast mm -hmm. I should say and that's to the northeast and that's what that's what's predicted what's going to happen on the you know the weather channel it's going to head to the northeast then your thermal even though it's doing all these different things here, pulling air in, pulling air out, the overall system, the entire system, is going will way. move to the northeast. Correct. Correct. So Ooh, I, I go back to my original statement. I'm, I'm just going to quit. This is <laughs> this golf is way too hard. Well, we're just nerding out on it. You don't have to know it all, but like <laughs> we're nerding kidding. out on it. So like, so in in this situation with this with this particular shot, everything, um, we one thing that we had is a massive parking lot. And so this parking lot is hot. It's asphalt, and it's just radiating heat. So into it's, the sky. Constantly it's constantly drawing thermal after it's thermal. It's constantly after just thermal. yeah, yeah. So they're just so it, I don't have to wait that long. And and thermals kind of they'll they'll almost especially when they're going at the wind. If you have a trigger point, you have a parking lot or something. It's constantly like think of like I said, boiling water in a pan, and you see like the bubble. Go, so this is why if you're a local on a course and you're shooting around with the locals. Even though the wind's blowing this way, they'll tell you, oh, no, it always blows left to right up there. Even if they don't know why, mm -hmm. they know it's always blowing left to right. There's a cause of it. There's a cause of All, it. But, you know, again, what the cause of it is not important to your score in, in some ways, just knowing that it always blows that way. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that it, do you think talking to the locals, do you think shooting around with a local player Who's, who is skilled enough to be able to have learned these things is beneficial when you're coming to a new course. I'll, I'll use um, this current course here, Red Mountain Disc Golf Course in East Mesa, Arizona. Um, it's a desert course. Now, 
a lot of guys they come out here and they practice for a tournament, right? A local tournament just can't happen a, a week, a week so, a week or so ago, and they come out and they play the course early morning. I practice every morning. They tell me, and then tournament day comes and I just get crushed. I don't understand. It's never the wind is never the same, and and so I my my common question or the statement would be, do you play in the afternoon? Um, because if you're if you're a morning player you get crushed in the afternoon. If you're an afternoon player, you're getting crushed in the morning. And so I come out here. This is good and, stuff. And, and so if, if, we, if we take ourselves at this general, this is, this, is, this is fun, just knowing like, whether I'm completely right in understanding the exact why, I feel like I've got a, a decent little grip on, on, on part of a reason, is this course is oriented east, west, north, south, the property. Now, I'm gonna just draw like a large, so here we have the, the, the Phoenix area, right? Like this is the, let's go downtown Phoenix is here. We're way out here, right? And this is our little bitty course. Now, every day in the morning, you're going to have wind coming from the, from typically more easterly going to the west. We have air traveling this way, okay? Now what happens is is, is Phoenix Wait, is, in the morning it's going from the east to the west. Typically, like like I said, it'll, it'll it'll move like this. So, but early mornings you're gonna have this wind kind of going this way. Okay. Okay. It's gonna be kind of moving, but but we have to understand the general like early morning for just a little while is Phoenix is that way. Downtown Phoenix is over here. Now, it's called the Valley of the Sun because it's a valley and the sun shines on it. And there's a whole lot of concrete and asphalt out there, and that gets hot quickly. And as that gets hot, the whole air over the entire Phoenix metropolitan area goes up, which is why it doesn't rain here that often and less each year because this heat goes up and any moisture that would want to come in hits this giant massive wall of hot air and goes around it. Okay. So there's so in other words, we're talking about thermals on the course, but we're existing in a therm uh, a, a larger a massive thermal. super thermal. Yeah, kind of. Is that the technical term? I don't know if that, I don't think that would be the technical term, but I mean, basically it's generating it's kind of its own weather. To, and so the air gets pulled in from the cooler desert okay. into the high, hot city. As this is going up, it's pulling air in on a, on a large scale. So this also then would mean that even though the weather channel prediction for the state of Arizona is a wind heading a certain direction, it does not mean that in your local area, you can count on that description that, you have to count on your baseline or your truth mm -hmm. based on your area because it's going to flow slightly different as it moves around the larger topography of your land of, of your area okay this may i mean I, I think this is great too especially like in the midwest maybe other places as well but mid, the midwest is notorious for wind blowing to the northeast i mean mm -hmm. it, it blows one direction yeah but if you are on the northeast side of kansas city you might expect it to either blow less or even to the southwest it's as it's being drawn up towards a bit. yeah different parts of the day so what happens is they come here in the morning and they awesome. play and they get used to playing the specific winds for each hole that is based on this this kind of morning wind that is that is within this this direction but this has not heated up yet is that, that right well that's heating up oh, it's heating so, up, so it's pulling the air in from from the cooler deserts the air is getting pulled in as the ground heat as the hot air over the city heats but up but throughout the day though this is going to intensify it intensifies the thermal gets stronger thing, thing, things kind of then after throughout the day this intensifies and then things kind of reach an equilibrium in the afternoon oh they do I mean, it, ish even, ish where okay. things begin to move that kind of basic truth but what happens in the evening is this cools down does it cool down faster than the surrounding? I don't I don't quite understand that. But what I do know is that in the evening, we always have a headwind on half these holes. So the air changes direction. So like I would use, when we come to Red Mountain, there's a little island hole. And in the mornings, you're always gonna play a tailwind on it. And in the evenings, late afternoon, you're gonna have a headwind. And so people get, there, get to there in the afternoon, play their round in the afternoon, and they get crushed on that hole because it's a different wind than they ever played. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, um another revelation that we hadn't talked about earlier because uh, one of the things I always kind of chuckle at in a very nice non-condescending way but when I'm with a local player and they're like well yeah most players typically want to throw the highest here under the and I, and, I, and I just kind of like politely thank them and think to myself yeah I know how to play the hole mm -hmm. uh, like I don't need to be told what route to throw it but that you know again it sounds arrogant but it's, eh, well, it's, true. it's I've, true I've been playing forever um, however 
in between those, he should probably throw a skip shot here, Scott. In between those, when he's when he or she says, "Hey, the wind typically swirls down here, or it's typically, you know, it's typically a headwind down there," I should be all ears for that one. Most because likely, that's that's some information that is not information that I had for the whole that I had to gain from the player because I would have no way of knowing that. Hey, you go down and test it. Just test that theory. If they say this is it, like don't shut it off, but like kind of really that's pay attention to stuff. what's going on because because um, let, let's use a tree line. Let me, let me think of a good hole. Let me think of a good hole. Uh, I would say, and I've seen it happen, it depends on the year, right? Um, maybe hole 14, Winthrop. You're up along the Coliseum, going down to the elevated basket on the edge of the... Okay, sure. So so you have a big building there, right? Building's on the right side. If you throw too high, the disc is going to lift and take off. But if you can, depending on which way the wind is going, sometimes the wind can come over the building and dump, and you can throw right along the Coliseum, and you can drop it down in there. Mm -hmm. M most guys now are throwing the, have a forehand or so on the forehand to get to play into safe. Right, right, right. But what's going to happen is if you, let's say you have the wind coming this way, the wind is going to hit that building and it's going to rise. And it's always going to rise when it hits that building. It's going to rise and... If, and and all, the building's hot on top and it's, it's going to be pulling air. Thermal. So you, got, you have two things happening. Mm -hmm. So when you're throwing from the building, you're probably almost always going to feel you're, a you're, headwind. You're actually tucked up in that little pocket and you don't feel what's going on down there. You have to look at the flags and what's going on. But, but okay, so you, you might not yeah, yeah. feel it, but, but you're throwing into a headwind. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're throwing across the building, I guess it's a crosswind. It really depends. I don't know that land, the, 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 the prevailing wind there too much. I've only played a few times, but like I know no, I, I get there's, there's corridors down. If you have a building like this, um, I'll use kind of the same example. I played this, this tournament locally out in Maricopa, and there's a, this is a brick wall housing over here, and we tee down here, but there's like this eight foot wall kind of like this wall here, that, that's like the backyard fence of somebody. And we're down in this little basin, throwing down, it's 300 feet. And it was blowing probably 30 miles an hour. But the air was blowing up this way over the, over the houses. And so guys, the normal shot is to throw a hyzer over the wall, over the house, and then back 300 feet down the fairway and spike it. But if you have a 30 mile an hour wind and you throw a spike, where's the disc gonna go? Mm -hmm. Out there. And there's no matter how wide you threw it, it was blowing so hard it was gonna take you across the street. And so what I did is I went down the fairway and I just threw grass. Since we had a backup, I went down and threw grass down the fairway to see. Because typically as the air is going over over the land this way, the air is going to kind of come over this hill. And you're going to be in this little tunnel because we're below the wind in this little valley. So I threw, and the air was basically just swirling. The grass was just kind of floating in here. And so everybody else threw their shot, went out of bounds. And I just took a mid and threw straight up the gut, knowing that I was, I was protected. Don't give the wing to the wind, right? And so understanding the premise of how the airflow would go over this, the wall would protect me from the wind. And then you're going to do the same thing with a big building, like the width of Coliseum, is you've got that big building right there. You're throwing down. And depending on if the wind is coming or if it's triggering heat, if, if the building's hot, the air is going to be kind of coming up the hill like this. And you're going to get weird lift. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's all depending on the time of day. Like I said, probably far too complicated, but understanding that, that a building really – can can block the wind like right right here we're behind this wall because there's a breeze and it isolates us from the wind but if i threw a shot out from here all of a sudden my disc is going to get completely wrecked compared to what I, if i'm just going off of what i feel in my moment right gotcha and and, and what you're describing I, I love because it it follows the same idea of show less of the wing yeah. of the disc don't turn your wing into a sail i'm going to put that on a shirt uh, <laughs> But it, it also, it's, uh, it's interesting because I've always noticed and I've told people, players that play in the wind who are good all throw flat and straight. Because if they don't, they're not good in the wind. Uh, and players like Bradley Williams and Eric McCabe and Kevin McCoy, like there are players that are 20 rating points higher in the wind without necessarily even whether or not they're playing better, they have a style of game that is just fair. But, yeah. I mean, Bradley Williams in a 30 mile an hour wind could win worlds. I mean, he, yeah. he could win worlds anyways. But I mean, like he's one of the favorites because he has this, like I, I've never seen a player throw as pure, flat and straight as Brad. Mm -hmm. And in the wind, that, that's an advantage. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously it's a huge advantage. Um, all right, so I think we can like, generally wrap it up here I mean, we could probably talk all day on this yeah 
Um, I, let's talk a little bit about win strategy. Um, I'm not going to get into, you know, having what angle you put on mm -hmm. the disc in this situation. I mean, that a lot of that, if not all of it, it really does come with experience. And it's, again, it's not a satisfying answer, but nobody's out there with a protractor and a wind gauge going yeah. nine degrees, eight degrees. I mean, no one. It's, it is a feel thing. Uh, everyone gets it, but it's feel. But what about overall wind strategy? Like, okay. what, what's your baseline for what we do in the wind? Um, my baseline is I typically, like like we said earlier, I try and make sure I don't give the wing to the wind. That's my number one rule. When you're putting, don't give the wing to the wind. Put it, like, I putt as flat as possible. Um, Drop, I, drives too when possible? As possible, yeah. Like, And, and if I'm going to play the wing with the wind, I know that I have to play it way wider. Or, you know, we're, we're always trying to make the angle so that the wind has as, li as little effect on the disc as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I always just... I. I I've got a game that's kind of designed around. I learned to play in Pine Top, and it's it's windy eight months out of the year there. So it's like, like I said, the, a lot of the guys you named they play in very windy places. You know, you've got Bradley Williams, you've got Eric McCabe, you've got Ron Combers, you've got these different guys. They're all like incredible wind yeah, players. Ron, of course. You know, he's like a genius at, at playing the wind, but he also has all these like really watch him. He's got these really cool style, these really cool angles that he hits, so that he never gives the wing to the wind. And, you know, when he does give the wing to the wind, you'll just see him, ah, 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 you know? Yeah, I mean, players so, develop their styles. If they're good, they've developed for the areas. Like, I, yeah. can, I can pick out a North Carolina golfer yeah, from sure. a mile away because they, they throw like a woods golfer, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly how you should throw in the woods. They're not throwing wrong. They're throwing a style of play that, that is not conducive to a 12,000-foot course. Mm -hmm. They don't play 12,000-foot yeah. courses. So the wind players do the same thing, right? I mean, they just naturally – you either develop that style or – you wonder why you keep getting beat every week at least. Yes, exactly. So you have to. Yeah. One thing I want I want to touch on really quickly is we talked. You know, there's the general rule: a tailwind will drop a disc, a headwind will lift a di lift a disc. But there's times when a headwind will drop a disc, and there's times when a tailwind will lift a disc, and that has to do with thermals. And um, uh, so basically, my one, that's one of my main baselines is understanding what's going on there. Like I said. Uh, Wind kind of moves and sets. I can listen for when a gust is coming. I can hear the trees up the fairway, and I can hear them shh. You can hear it over there before it gets to you a lot of times. And so if you know there's a set coming at you, this, this gust is coming, that, that's probably going to last, at least here, it lasts, you know, 20, 30 seconds. So I know if that gust is coming, once it gets to me, I need to pot before that. And so I've got, it like, my timing, my rhythm, and wind almost just switches to, like, feel of when I know things are coming, and the other is like, I can test. Um, can I show you something real quick? Mm, please. This right here is what hunters will use for understanding where the wind is going so that they can track deer and not the, have the deer let them smell. I wonder what the wind's doing right here. Like it's, so when I'm on, like every, every now and then, and I've had this happen, it's just a powder. And so what it does, it's so light, it just disperses with the wind. You can see exactly what it's doing. You'll see, like, <laughs> if you're playing a casual round and your buddy vapes, like, you're going to see that cloud do this thing. Like, that's a huge advantage, actually, if you know how to use it. Because when you're putting and you've got a tailwind and you blow smoke out, or if you have powder, you have dust. I said this happened where a car drove by and dust came in. And I had this tailwind, but the dust was lifting. It was going out. And so I knew that my disc wasn't going to necessarily drop. I could putt a pretty true putt and not have to, like, play so high above it. And so knowing that that air was pretty sustainable, even though it was a tailwind, um, allowed me to play that well. Like, if you start understanding the difference in the temperature and how this feels, um, you're gonna, you, you'll be able to learn to intuit, intuitively know kind of what's going on around you. But like I said, I, I listen for the waves of the wind coming. I listen for if the wind is going. I can feel if the air gets cold. If the air gets cold around you, it's not a ghost. It's not a ghost. It's it's just it's just the backside of a thermal that right. is that is, that is cool air coming down, and if you get in this like all of a sudden it's sweltering warm, you're in lift. You're in you're in air that's rising, hot air. You're right in it. You're in a thermal, and so those kind of things help me understand that like you know if I if I've got a headwind or let's just say static air and I'll put a put a putt and it's static air and it lifts and I'm like what was that? I know because I I now know I can read that a whole lot better because I can feel that it's really warm and I know that that, that it basically it's going to um, help me make a good choice on how high I put or whatnot. Gotcha. So showing 
as little of the disc to the wind as possible, mm -hmm. throw and putt flat, listening, at, or first learning to listen to your senses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, instead of just, you know, I feel the wind blowing this way, but actually putting thought into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it possible to overthink the wind? Yes. So, like you said, I, 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 I love it so much. It's like just I nerd out on it all the time. So, like, it actually helps me, like, not really stress about my game as much. Um, every now and then I've, I've made a wrong decision based on because I overthought it. But overall, it's because I've done it for so long, it's like anything. You, you've got this feeling of what's going on. I think this is going on. I can see the trees moving down the fairway. I can make a pretty good educated guess of what's going on. And um, for, for new people, overthinking is going to be the major problem, right? Like we're, like we're not dealing with, well, it's just a, it's just a tailwind. Um, we're, we're learning that the air moves like a fluid and that I'm playing in that fluid. And so learning just like if, in casual rounds, I, I, I'll sit here and I'll watch the hawk soar. And I know if I see a hawk going up over here, I always get pointed, hey, look at this. And we'll get, inevitably, air is going to shift towards that hawk mm -hmm. because he's found the core of the biggest thing going up in the sky. And so um, that was something I did at, at, at Worlds this last year. I got to play around with the, uh, one of the East Coast guys, Dan Hastings. Yeah, um, yeah, I know Dan. Dan, uh, and, and so we played That's around great. together and, and like, uh, Mulligans is a really windy course and it shifts all over the place, but you're also in flat area. It's open. And, uh, so like walking along with them and going like, look at, look at the, look at the birds. The birds are over there. That's why you're shifting there. And just, just, so all of a sudden it, it demystifies the fact that, that, um, it's some magic or some voodoo going on out there when you can know that the air is shifting, it's going over there and it's affecting me in this realm, then it's not just some random, like you said, it's not voodoo. It's, it's, uh, it's science. You can see what's going on and then you can make decisions based on what's going on. All right. And final question. You go to a tournament with 110 players. Let's take the top 10 pros out of the equation. So we're left with a hundred players of your, you know, your below average pros all the way down to beginning players. It's a windy day. How many of those hundred players do you believe are playing too aggressively for the conditions relative to where they would score best? Like if, if you were okay. catting for all hundred players, how many of them would you have told to play more conservative than they actually played? I'd say a lot of them. Okay. I, I, the reason I was asking, I, I think is 97%. Yeah. I, you, know, you, play, you play well in the wind by screwing up less. Not by making shots. Mm -hmm. By screwing up less. Yeah. I, 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 until you get to the very highest level and you still, like, still got to make shots, but that's those people. Because of that example, like I'm going to use Dan as an example, because he was t he was really worried about playing mulligans. It's an open golf course. You don't play open golf courses in Carolinas, right? Mm -hmm. Typically, and so he just like I'm really nervous about this course. Please take me to the woods. And once we got through a round <laughs> of really going, explaining what's going on, and then why you would choose certain angles and, and different shots, um, it, it demystified it for him. And he actually shot his best rounds there. Really? Yeah. Nice. And so, like, he's like, well, now that, that explains why like, when, when at home I play this one tournament and there's this one big open field and it's just like I don't have a clue. I hate this stretch of a couple holes because you throw into this meadow and your disc goes everywhere. And now it's like I just had a talk with him about what would be happening and all of a sudden it demystified it. Now he's got a good idea of what needs to happen and he's got a good idea of, like, how to read what's going on with the air, in, in flow into fields from cooler meadows and you know, right. trees and... And so, like, once you demystify the thing, all of a sudden you can just make, you don't have to get into the thick of it, but you can understand why what's mm -hmm. going on is going on and then make choices from there. And Dan's a real good example, which is, Dan's a very good player. Dan's incredible. He's, right. So, first you have to know what your discs do and how to control them. And, and you know, be, mm -hmm. until you can do that, it's, wind is all borderline irrelevant. Yeah. But once you're a, uh, a skilled player like Dan, yeah. Then knowing the wind matters. Anything else to add? Scott, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I know I get no, I, my, my, my gig is being long winded and probably using oh, too many no, words, no, but I really no, like this was this is uh No, I want I wanted to do a deep dive on this because I felt like this was better as a 
a full nerding out conversation. Like you're on a podcast right now talking about mm -hmm. a podcast called Disc Golf Wins Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but like, you know, it's just a conversation about it. But if you watch this, especially if you watch it multiple times, like there's gold in here. There are things, there's certainly things that we've talked about in last week that I didn't know. Yeah. Or if I knew, I mean, I'm a science nerd. Mm -hmm. I understand how, how and why wind works. But for some reason, I just never really connected the dots on the course. I never thought about the parking lot being the reason why it affects it and, and allowed me to predict. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned something this week, which is really exciting uh, as I shock the world next year. Now, now that now that I know about this, that's the difference. Um, but I, no, it's just I, I love learning more. So there's going to be an audience of people that are like, eh, and there's going to be people that are going to be super excited. And so yeah, this is not for everybody. This is this is very high level stuff. Uh, if a lot of this is just blowing right past you, and you're new to disc golf, rewatch this in a year, and a lot of these things are going to make sense. You know, I. Uh what really got me into this is I've always been fascinated by birds. I've always been fascinated by watching hawks and, and the eagles and all those those animals soar. And um, I've, flew, I've flown RC airplanes for a good part of probably 15 years now. Mm. But, you know, five, about four and a half, four years ago, I was uh, playing disc golf with the, one of the local guys here in Arizona who used to play disc golf a lot, uh, George Morris. And he's since, you know, he, he, he's, he's actually a world champion at flying this these... Uh, discus launch gliders look up discus launch gliders you're going to kind of have your brain melt on what, what they're able to accomplish um and i was playing fountain hills with him and i had this random headwind on a hole that should have been a left to right tail and i said george what's going on you know and he said uh he looked over at the water and the water you can see the way the ripples on the water were moving he said oh there's a thermal right there and i knew about thermals i didn't understand them um but i knew because if you play a fountain too fountains like a wild ride mm. of winds. Um, he pointed at the water, and all of a sudden I could see where the air was being pulled to. And it opened up the world to me. Like, I just had this awakening, like, oh my goodness. And I said, George, you know, I, I knew exactly what to throw on the shot. I could see 100 feet away the tree was blowing, and then 150 feet away the next tree was perfectly still. So this particular thermal was only affecting my location up to about 100 feet, right? Like 150 feet. And so, like, um, I knew exactly what shot to throw, and I parked the hole, and I did it because I knew what areas I had to beat. And after that, I just told George, I said, George, I want to learn what you know. Um, I mean, he's, his, his family used to fly real sailplanes and, and soar and stuff, and he, him and his brother are just geniuses. George is one of the top people in the world that get it uh, and understand it on a, on a very deep level. And so I've just kind of like, I picked stuff up from him and I've flown a bunch of glider contests, you know, locally, just local club contests and stuff. And I've learned so much. That's why a lot of this stuff, it's, it's very detailed, but we're doing with detail within our realm instead of like on a global scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. This is great. All right. Um, so just a reminder again, uh, there'll be a link in the description, Pete Ulibarri's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can be doing more videos about wind. Uh, you do lessons and other instruction here. Yeah. You're also involved. You run events. I, I run a couple a year. I help out with the uh, Arizona Disc Golf Association here in the state, and we we kind of help other events go, and we kind of just do our best to grow the sport. Would you do lessons for someone specifically on wind? If someone if someone wanted to come out who's done other lessons before, or maybe they don't feel like they need lessons, or maybe they don't even need lessons. Maybe they are skilled and have good technique. Can you, in an hour, take him out, show, probably to Fountain Hills, probably a great place, yeah, and teach him about the wind? I think I think in an hour, I can have somebody have a general base understanding of what's going on around them, um, to kind of get a good feel of understanding. You know, this is uh, this could be something like a real nice niche for you, a very very high level niche. Like I'm thinking about the MMA fighters, they have a gym, they have training partners, they have coaches, but they will often seek out a certain skill over here because even though they, they have quality teaching, they're skilled athletes, they're, they can still shore up their game 
because there are people that know more about them and at their coaches yeah. at this thing. And, and uh, like, I mean, I've had 44 years of disc golf conversations and I've never had one that I felt was as useful as this at Thanks what so. we're talking about. No, I mean that. Yeah. Um, I don't throw around compliments. Just, I mean, if I had said this to eight other people, it'd all be up in social media and I would sound like, <laughs> a, like an ass. I mean this. And so I think that at the highest level, people can get together uh, with you. Uh, just promise me you'll charge them. You're such a nice guy. <laughs> okay. Promise me you'll charge, charge people for, your, for what you have because you have something that, that's worth, worth paying for. Uh, I mean, but don't charge me. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna. I'm gonna send you visitors. But everyone but me charge. Thanks. <laughs> Sounds man. good. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, be sure to click like, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever the heck that means. All the YouTubers say to do it, so you should do it too. And uh, uh, look forward to the next video. Thanks, man. See you guys. Thank you.